السلام علیکم خواتین حضرات آئی ویلکم یو ٹو دا ورچوئل یونیورسٹی آف پاکستان وی آر گیٹنگ ان ٹو لیکچر نمبر ٹوینٹی ٹو آف دا برانڈ مینجمنٹ ایم کے ٹی سکس ٹو فور لیٹ می گیو یو اے ری کیپ آف دا پریویس لیکچر نمبر ٹوئنٹی ون وی لرن ٹو بیسکلی دا کانسیپٹ آف برانڈ ایکسٹینشن وائی ڈو وی ہیو ٹو گیٹ ان ٹو برانڈ ایکسٹینشنس دیٹ از وٹ وی ڈسکسڈ اینڈ آئی تھنک یو ول ری کال that the one positioning just cannot satisfy with all the needs that customers may have within one market. And therefore, in order to satisfy those needs, you have to have different products and different brands. The big question that the brand managers and marketing managers can have today is what kind of brands or what brand names to use in order to introduce those new offerings. And uh, we learned that uh, it is always uh, the more uh, useful and uh, the cheaper and uh, the more attractive to go for those brands which already exist on the market. Because of the factor of uh, familiarity of uh, customers with those brands and uh, it is like I said much cheaper uh, to introduce existing brands uh, in relation to uh, new brands altogether meaning stand alone brands. While discussing um, uh, brand extensions, we arrived at uh, two conclusions. We need to go into an extension when uh, we are dealing with uh, evolving needs, the meaning a situation which offers us opportunity to respond to needs which are changing with the changing times and uh, we extend the line in order to satisfy those needs. And uh, we extend the line or stretch the line Uh, the by satisfying needs of uh, the same customers or uh, the customers within the same uh, segment or the category. Such products are um, closely related. The other situation uh, that brand managers could find themselves to get into uh, relating to uh, the brand extensions is when uh, there's an opportunity to get into a different market altogether. If you're working in one category and uh, just because uh, the brand carries a lot of value and power and uh, there is an opportunity in some other market which is new altogether so you feel the need to go to that market and satisfy that need with the help of the brand which already exists and that makes a lot of sense. Um, in relation to that we discussed uh, the concept of uh, line extension in uh, pretty much detail that uh, we can get into extensions by multiplying the line uh, in terms of uh, different sizes, uh, different formats, uh, the different ingredients, the different uh, the physical um, characteristics uh, by getting into product add-ons, uh, so on and so forth. So there are so many different ways which uh, actuate us to or rather which present us with uh, some solid uh, logic and therefore rationale to decide how should we multiply the line by what kind of um, mechanism meaning multiplication mechanism um, and in relation to that we discussed uh, what are the uses or what are, what are the positive sides of uh, line extension uh, there are uh, the few sides that we discussed I think four or five but one being um, it increases the usage uh, of uh, the product or the products and uh, hence provides the company with market depth. It uh, reinforces uh, sales because you know, it, it increases the usage. So it provides you with uh, a bigger and a wider market base within which you play and hence increase your sales. During the process of uh, doing all that, uh, the brands uh, present themselves as um, things which are uh, friendly and which are caring and I'll give you examples of how the brands tend to be friendly and caring. Another positive side uh, that we discussed in the previous lecture uh, relating uh, line extensions is uh, that line extension pushes boundaries and uh, I, I explained the concept in fairly detailed manner. One more positive side of uh, line extension is that uh, it revitalizes failing brands and uh, we discussed in uh, again detail the ailing and the sick brands, how they get propped up with the help of um, a renewed uh, 
extension which has uh, renewed features uh, but which uh, certainly has uh, the same value framework so that you do not really move uh, too far away from uh, the inner core. The last uh, the positive side which uh, I have in my mind at the moment to discuss with you is um, that line extension maintains a very strong uh, relationship between the share of the market and uh, the share of the shelf. Now, this is uh, a very uh, delicate and sensitive kind of um, an aspect uh, which uh, has to be viewed uh, in relation to uh, the retailer's power, um, which we shall be discussing in a few moments again, and in relation to the limited space that uh, the supermarkets nowadays have to offer some of the different uh, players within um, uh, the market. You are uh, operating in one particular category and uh, you know that you are not going to be the only one. You are, you are not the only one. Uh, there are other uh, players who happen to be major players. And uh, all the players like to uh, develop a good relationship with uh, the members of the trade, meaning retailers in particular. Because that's where your products get displayed. And that's where the ultimate consumer or the customer walks in uh, to buy whatever he or she likes. So there is uh, a tremendous uh, the pressure on uh, the companies uh, to gain as much share of the space as possible. You can uh, put it this way, uh, although this is not a statement that I'm going to make, that uh, the larger the space that you get uh, in the supermarket, uh, the larger the market share that you may have. Now, it is not that always that you're going to get uh, a, a major a chunk of the market share if you have uh, the major chunk of uh, the shelf space. The correlation that is drawn uh, is uh, on the basis of uh, consistent performance, um, which, in other words, means that uh, if uh, retailers, by and large, are receptive to the one particular brand or a handful of brands which they perceive as, uh, or which they know uh, are uh, the powerful brands uh, and which enjoy large shares uh, of uh, the market, uh, the retailers uh, definitely are more inclined uh, to offer uh, better space, uh, not only larger, but also the prime space, uh, which is, uh, you know, which looks right into the eyes of the customer, which is at the eye level, and uh, the kind of things that you have learned in the basic marketing course. So if there is uh, a, a, a larger uh, display area relating to the one brand, uh, it can be assumed that this brand has a larger share of the market. Otherwise, the retailer will not uh, provide uh, that particular brand uh, a larger share of the space uh, on a consistent basis. So line extension provides the companies with an opportunity whereby they can gain more space within the supermarket or within a retail outlet, so to say, and keep the competition out. How do they do that? I think it is very obvious that when you have a strong brand and you have more than one offering, it goes without saying that retailer is going to be more receptive to offer the more space or space, not more space, space to get all those new offerings, uh, thereby providing you with an aggregate space which is more than uh, had you had just the one offering. So that is how line extension maintains a good uh, relationship between the market share and um, the share of the shelf space. Now, having said that, let me now get uh, to the negative side of uh, line extension. Like I pointed out to you, everything has uh, the negative side also, and line extension also has uh, a negative side. What that side is, uh, what the side is, let us take uh, a look at that. Uh, first of all, I would like to maintain uh, a connection between the last uh, the positive side of uh, the line extension, which is uh, the relationship between the market share and uh, uh, shelf space share, it is that particular area or that uh, the particular arena the from where stems uh, the power of the retailer. 
retailers are uh, so uh, sought after uh, the entities uh, in companies are uh, so much uh, interested in cultivating the good relationships with uh, the retailers that um, there is uh, a, a tremendous competition between uh, the companies to um, get uh, the better uh, space of the shelf. And uh, the more the brands that you have on the market, uh, the more power that gives to the retailer. Why? Because all the managers that are sitting in all the companies uh, are working on similar lines. And this is what uh, you know, that we keep discussing uh, frequently because uh, they all are into professional marketing. They do understand that one positioning cannot uh, satisfy all the needs. So that they have uh, similar parameters uh, on which they decide their decisions to uh, go for different brands. So in other words, they all work with uh, objectives which are very similar. And in the process, uh, what happens is that at the end of the day, they all uh, end up with uh, different products and uh, with different um, uh, rationale. Uh, I mean, those products are supported by uh, different uh, the rationale. Um, when that happens, that creates what you may call bottlenecks at the retail level. Those are the bottlenecks which uh, necessitate uh, for the retailer, a typical retailer, to think with which products to accommodate more and which to accommodate less. Now, naturally, a retailer is going to be more receptive to those brands which are more powerful and which enjoy a higher level of sales because it is all about the business. The game of business is free of any emotions and therefore maintaining relationships does not really center on how close you are to a retailer in terms of your personal behavior and personal relationship. It is all about business objectives. If you have uh, a powerful brand, a valuable brand, uh, which offers the good value and power to the retailer also, your personal behavior and relationship with the retailer is going to be of value. If uh, it is the otherwise, the meaning the brand is not very powerful, the relationship is uh, very uh, positive, um, it will not take you uh, that far uh, toward achieving your goals. So. Retailer power is uh, the one thing which um, becomes the negative side of uh, the line extensions. And in the case, your brand does not happen to be um, a powerful brand and somebody else's brand is a powerful brand and that brand uh, offers you know, so many different offerings um, supported by very solid and logical positionings and uh, thereby keeping you out of the uh, relevant space. To counter uh, this kind of a situation, uh, all you can do is to make your, to try to make your brand valuable and uh, try to get uh, as high on the brand value pyramid as is possible. One of the implications of retailer power is that it leads to the discrimination and uh, discrimination is uh, obvious because of the factors which I just uh, cited. When you have a brand uh, which is less than strong, which is not very powerful, uh, naturally uh, you get pushed out. And uh, when you uh, get uh, discriminated against, uh, you resort to uh, tactics uh, which uh, you might call uh, promotions. Uh, but you get into those promotions at that particular juncture only because as uh, the marketing people, you are a little uh, desperate, you know. You have to regain the shelf space and uh, you have to regain uh, the share that you have lost in the market. And uh, you resort to promotional tactics. Those promotional tactics may not be very positive all the time. Why? Because it is not only you it is other brands also which are not very strong and also have been discriminated against. So you all um, on your own, but very independently, they get into those promotions and the whole thing snowballs. It increases in intensity and uh, it leads toward what you may call a price war because everybody's offering, you know, buy one, get one free, I'm going to buy one and get that much discount 
And when everybody is um, uh, trying to push and precipitate you know, sales uh, by these kind of promotional tactics, um, the result is uh, the market gets uh, very price conscious. And um, if uh, that kind of an activity persists on part of so many different uh, major uh, players, um, well, different players, let's not call them major players, but by different players, uh, the chances are it uh, will erode to some extent the element of uh, the brand uh, loyalty and uh, the customers are going to be inclined toward those brands which are offering uh, the very interesting and very uh, inviting kind of um, campaigns uh, or schemes. That is where uh, the brands start losing uh, loyalty. And uh, there are situations uh, in which uh, the market leader, meaning uh, the most powerful brand or um, powerful brands uh, at the top of the pyramid, they also have to follow suit, feel dragged into that um, price war uh, kind of a situation uh, because um, the market leader uh, thinks that the competitors uh, have uh, made things difficult uh, for them and um, they have to give them a dose of their own medicine uh, with the meaning that uh, they must be taught a lesson and uh, in um, thinking so they also jump on the same bandwagon of uh, the so-called promotions and uh, they start getting into the price discounts and cuts with the net result that um, uh, it becomes kind of a full-blown uh, price war in the market uh, where uh, the weaker ones get uh, pushed out and uh, they might be crowded out you know, for all times to come. Uh, this is what does happen uh, in the markets. And uh, those uh, who can withstand uh, the rigors uh, of uh, the war uh, may survive, but then you see at a very heavy cost. But the net net result of uh, the war is that people become, I mean, the customers become so much familiar, uh, so much uh, accustomed to uh, the discounts that um, the points of differentiation uh, get uh, eroded and uh, that everybody likes to buy those uh, products or those brands that within that particular category at uh, discounts. The, uh, the brands which um, uh, at one time enjoyed uh, the very top level of uh, the brand value of uh, the pyramid, they also slip down and uh, a time also comes when all the major brands have to start uh, kind of a new life, uh, talking once again or working once again with uh, the basic attributes and the features uh, which is the, the bottom level of the value pyramid. So this is uh, the one uh, negative side of uh, the brand extensions, uh, which um, uh, must lead us to uh, believe that uh, any extension that we get into has got to be based on certain uh, solid logic and uh, a rationale, uh, without uh, the meaningful points of differences and uh, without um, very uh, forceful uh, kind of uh, uh, reasons that we should not get into meaningless differentiations and uh, therefore meaningless introductions of uh, the line. We should refrain from uh, that kind of a stretch. The second negative side of uh, line extension uh, is uh, uh, what we may call lack of uh, scale economies. As against a mono product, meaning just one brand and one product, Handling and managing a variety of uh, the products or brands is cumbersome. It is difficult in uh, relation to uh, production, in relation to uh, inventory, in relation to logistics, and in relation to uh, costing point of view. How uh, these problems come up, I think it is obvious uh, that you are dealing with a bunch of products as against just one product. But when you have just one product, the whole assembly line or the whole operation, a small operation or a big operation, whatever. The whole operation is concentrating on producing just one brand or just one product, which is the mainstay of the company. Conversely, you are dealing with a situation in which you have you know, four or five or maybe even more products 
that which have different formats, which have different sizes, which have different uh, tastes and flavors, uh, that which are going to have different ingredients and therefore different packaging and different this and different that, meaning all the mix of variables relate, relating those to the products uh, are going to so diverse that uh, managing all those uh, becomes more challenging than managing a mono product. So we can say with uh, the confidence that uh, a mono product is uh, a, a large volume product and uh, the extended uh, the brands or extended offerings are uh, low volume uh, or uh, lower volume, I shouldn't say low, lower volume items. Uh, it goes without saying that anything which uh, is larger in volumes uh, has uh, a higher capacity and capability to offer the company with uh, scale economies and anything which is uh, smaller in volumes has a lower capability of uh, offering scale economies, if at all those lower volume items do. So, in turn, we can say that uh, the smaller runs uh, deprive the company of uh, scale economies, uh, which uh, uh, is something that uh, every company likes to achieve. How do you go for a mix of products so that uh, scale economies can also be achieved? That is uh, the job of uh, not just one manager, uh, but uh, all the managers uh, put together uh, who decide uh, based on so many different factors and so many different results uh, being produced by those offerings, you being one of those. No question about that. Mono product is cheaper to produce and others are uh, diverse products are uh, more expensive to produce. This is the net result. According to the one study carried out uh, in the United States, if we compare uh, the cost of production of a mono product, keeping 100 as the index uh, for that cost of production and uh, to compare that against uh, the corresponding costs of production for diversified products, the results are very interesting and uh, let me show you those results with the help of uh, this graphical illustration. As you can see, uh, the mono product is uh, the 100, uh, this could be you know, 100 rupees or uh, maybe 100 any currency. Look at uh, the category of uh, the foods. Uh, this is uh, the research finding of an actual study and um, in the area of foods, as against the index of 100 as cost of production, the cost of production in foods is 132. This increases to 135 when you start uh, operating in housery, for example, and uh, this goes for uh, a further jump uh, to uh, 145 if you are dealing uh, within uh, the, the car uh, category, meaning you're manufacturing cars. So this is a very uh, convincing kind of uh, a research finding which tells us uh, the difference between uh, different costs of production uh, that while you're dealing with a monoproduct and you're dealing with diversified products. Now, this is not to say that diversified products are to be avoided or you are to shy away from uh, getting into line extensions. This is to educate you on the uh, side of the line extensions which has uh, a direct bearing and costs and therefore you being uh, the brand manager must know how that cost factor comes into play and what are the implications and how to handle those and we're going to talk about that also. So we can also say based on uh, this factor of uh, scale economies that uh, uh, scale economies uh, get hurt uh, if uh, you are dealing with a mono product and that mono product has uh, huge volumes that are spread over a huge geographical area. That you have now introduced the diversified products, uh, the which certainly uh, have uh, the strong rationale and reason for being, uh, the, but uh, they have uh, their own um, uh, set of uh, an accompanying set of uh, dynamics, uh, which are uh, not to lose sight of. Uh, if you are uh, losing uh, the scale economies uh, to some extent, uh, you have to see to it that that factor is offset to buy something else, meaning to buy going for higher pricing. 
uh, because uh, there is something which uh, is a result of uh, smaller runs, uh, thereby giving you even higher costs. So those higher costs are to be met somewhere. You are not uh, incurring those costs just for the sake of incurring costs, but you have to recover those. Discussion on that in a moment. Could wait until that time. The third negative side of line extensions could, could be, you know, what you uh, marketing people may call that non-controlled extensions weaken range logic. Uh, what is the range logic? The range logic is a function of different positionings. You are trying to satisfy different needs within the category. You are hitting different segments and uh, you are being responsive in a very uh, effective way. Now, there's a limit to that. Uh, you have introduced something like you know, six or seven different offerings and uh, maybe you have reached a point which is the optimal point and going beyond that is going to translate into something undifferentiated or something uh, with meaningless and trivial differentiation. Because uh, getting into a new position uh, with uh, very strong logic uh, is very challenging and it is not easy. So what happens at that uh, juncture? Uh, you proliferate uh, the brands and when you proliferate the brands unnecessarily, you are providing uh, the, the retailers with uh, an awesome power uh, which is uh, not really called for and uh, you're also hurting uh, your own logic of extending the range because uh, the customers and also members of the trade who also could happen to be your uh, the customers uh, are going to think that um, the company has lost uh, all the logic uh, of getting into extensions and now they are extending uh, their brands uh, only for um, the sake of extending, meaning the extendability is not supported by uh, credibility. So uh, making sure that you remain credible and reliable, you are not to get into extensions which are very trivial and which are not very highly differentiated. One implication of uh, this um, um, proliferation is uh, that you end up cannibalizing your own brands. Uh, by cannibalize, cannibalization, uh, it is meant, uh, just like cannibals, if you do not know, but look into the dictionary, uh, like cannibals you know, eat each other. Uh, fish, for example, uh, the fish uh, eat fish. Just like that, unnecessary offerings on the market can eat into each other's volume. Now this is a very interesting uh, concept and this is something which does happen in the market if you start introducing brands or extended brands uh, losing sight of the range logic. Uh, what happens is that you are selling uh, the 100 units of one brand and you have unnecessarily gone into uh, the multiplication the by offering uh, the one more brand, if not more. And uh, you now have uh, the two brands. The volume that you thought could have jumped from 100 to something like you know, 125. Let us not talk about something very highly ambitious. Let us talk about something ambitious, but still achievable. You are talking about 25% increase, which is not a joke. Uh, that 25% increase, instead of that increment coming your way, what happens is that your volume stays at 100. Uh, how does that stay at 100? Because the brand that you were selling uh, 100 units of has gone down to 75 and 25 um, you are selling with the help of the new offering. So you are static and you think to yourself, I think it is quite a frustrating and embarrassing situation in which you may find yourself if you still have the same volume and uh, you have gone through with all the hassles of uh, developing that uh, new entry and uh, the hassles of uh, variables of production, inventory, logistics, costing, packaging, I mean so on and so forth. I've got a mix of so many variables with which uh, all the variables of marketing mix. Um, ending up with something which is, um, uh, which is, which is not uh, productive, which is rather unproductive, 
because it has started eating into the volumes that you once enjoyed. So you must uh, avoid that kind of a situation. Let me add here that uh, this uh, situation of uh, the cannibalization uh, does occur uh, when you go for, uh, when you opt you know, for a price war. Uh, because uh, you are going to opt for a price war, not only with the help of uh, your existing brand, but by offering a new uh, entry which uh, uh, carries a low price tag. And uh, to that, customers get accustomed. And that is how that lower price to the brand eats into the volumes of uh, the other brand which enjoyed at one time a higher price. So the results are obvious and I think you will agree with me that at any cost you must um, try to avoid the possibility of uh, the cannibalization. Uh, but then uh, the marketing people argue that uh, they do not get into these kind of situations by choice. They are dragged into these kind of situations. So in order to make sure that uh, you're not dragged into these situations, you have to preempt these situations where things could be more positive. And the more positive things are, uh, I would say, the pre-emptive uh, uh, management process, whereby you have to think of uh, extending your brands uh, on positive lines and uh, be ahead of the competition and uh, be able to find uh, those points of uh, the difference which really carry meaning uh, for your customers. If uh, you follow that logic, then you do not uh, lose sight of uh, the logic and run into a situation uh, which becomes uh, embarrassing for the marketing department and which does uh, bring the marketing department under a tremendous pressure from uh, the top management uh, and all others within the company. So having said uh, all that about um, uh, the negative side uh, of uh, the line extension. Uh, let us now uh, talk about uh, the reaction with which uh, the managers uh, show to the negative side of extensions. Uh, meaning, uh, what are the, the fixes now they can go for uh, in order to make sure that uh, the effect of uh, the negative side of line extensions is offset or if you know totally nullified, uh, if not totally nullified. Uh, it stands offset to a large extent. One of the practices which uh, companies could have started undertaking, I would give you an example of uh, a huge uh, the multinational, uh, the P&G, the company into uh, a host of uh, the consumer items, started desegmenting or counter-segmenting. That's what you may call, uh, this is part of the marketing literature, by the way, their product offerings, their brands. Uh, and uh, in early 90s, which is not that far back uh, into the history of marketing, they shrank their uh, base of brands by a factor of like 20 to 25%. Now, the offerings which they withdrew, of course, there were those offerings which were not, which were not highly profitable and uh, which were rather turning in uh, the lower levels of uh, the financial contribution and uh, the company thought uh, that by withdrawing uh, these offerings uh, they would be better off and they withdrew those. So this is uh, one of the uh, uh, steps which uh, the companies uh, have started taking. And you will also agree with me that uh, the proliferation uh, also leads to the consumer of the frustration. And uh, we can relate uh, to this consumer frustration with uh, what in one of the lectures I talked about as consumer revolt. So in order to uh, see to it that uh, there is no consumer revolt in the marketplace uh, in terms of their brands, uh, companies like uh, the one I have mentioned uh, have started getting into the concept of uh, desegmentation and uh, a counter of the segmentation because uh, they are convinced uh, that uh, with lesser number of brands uh, they are going to make uh, more profits than by offering uh, a larger number of brands. 
you are an expert by now on uh, you know these other matters and you will know why I'm talking about that because uh, it is not only uh, customer revolt it also is uh, the cost of production and uh, just imagine the the advantages that uh, follow the by withdrawing a few of those entries that are which were not profitable for you and uh, that you are uh, a happier lot or a happy lot if you were really frustrated and angry uh, that by uh, concentrating on just those which are profitable and uh, which uh, uh, have all the potential in the world to keep the company very viable. Uh, what are the immediate uh, the actions which um, companies can take uh, apart from um, uh, counter uh, segmentation or desegmentation in order to see to it that uh, line extensions they do not really carry a lot of uh, negative factors, meaning the negative side of line extensions uh, does not uh, outweigh the positive side of uh, line extension. Uh, one of the factors with which uh, the companies could have started uh, the following, uh, apart from uh, the counter and uh, desegmentation, is uh, to have uh, improved the cost accounting systems. Now, my intention here is not to get into the cost accounting uh, side of uh, the brand management, but this most certainly is one of the factors with which could have to be understood by brand managers because it is seen uh, through the, the marketing literature and through the practical experience um, you know in, in most of the countries of the world that uh, many companies uh, lack the good costing systems. Uh, you might be astonished to hear that but that is a fact. Uh, the marketing history and marketing literature is full of examples uh, that are dealing with uh, the companies that uh, do not really have uh, very good costing systems in place and therefore running into situations in which they do not know uh, what kind of costs uh, to charge uh, the what kinds of different brand heads and uh, the, that is what is meant by uh, the improved uh, the costing systems um, which uh, the must dictate that uh, the every cost has got to be very fairly and very judiciously and very equitably charged to the items uh, to which it belongs. Uh, it is not that uh, you are incurring uh, a lot of costs on um, uh, one particular brand and start charging another one uh, which is uh, very highly profitable uh, just in order to um, you know evade uh, some reality that uh, the brand which otherwise happens to be the darling of uh, the brand managers um, should remain away from uh, the site of uh, you know the top, top management um, or you know due to any other reasons you must be very very realistic and very accurate in charging costs uh, to the right um, heads meaning uh, the cost has got to be uh, charged to the brand where it belongs not only that uh, but also uh, you've got to look at uh, the costing of uh, the factor in terms of the financial contribution that uh, each brand uh, brings to the company. Meaning um, those brands or those offerings uh, which bring the company a higher level of uh, financial contribution have got to be supported with a higher level of uh, the marketing resource or overall resource so to say. There are situations in which uh, you have uh, the brands uh, which are huge in terms of volume but uh, they may not uh, be carrying a compatible level of profitability and uh, the higher level of profitability you are getting through a brand which is uh, not uh, as big uh, a volume seller. In that kind of situation uh, the big argument or debate within the company is uh, how to uh, divide uh, the resource, meaning the marketing resource uh, very judiciously. Well, different situations carry different dynamics and uh, being the marketing people and uh, being the, the costing and finance people within the same company, you are going to be in the most appropriate situation to decide what to do. But uh, as the logic goes, the 
brands where the higher levels of uh, financial contributions have got to be supported uh, accordingly. Meaning the brands which attract uh, the occasional buyers uh, it cannot be uh, supported or should not be uh, supported as much but as you support those which have a huge following. Third factor which you must take into consideration uh, while you consider how to offset the negative side of uh, the brand extensions is to take salespeople uh, into the fold. And uh, when I say taking them into the fold, what I mean is that salespeople have got to be able to define everything, I mean every single offering in its sales context. And whatever they do in the market or whatever they insist on introducing because the, the marketing process, as you all know, it starts from the market and people who are in the market all the time, perpetually, they're the salespeople. So it is the salespeople who come back to you again and again, suggesting to you that, uh, that this is the kind of offering that we should have in order to uh, satisfy that particular need of uh, the target market uh, because they are the people, remember we talked about that earlier, they are the people who are very familiar with the, the purchase criteria of uh, the customers and therefore the model that uh, you developed uh, in terms of uh, that model having a very strong orientation toward uh, customers uh, also had input uh, from the salespeople. So salespeople have got to define uh, what is the um, reason uh, for the existence or one particular offering or all the offerings for that matter in the context of uh, a very decent level of sales. I mean that level of sales has got to be decent. That's what, what I'm saying. And sales people have got to stay committed to the sales of uh, that offering or those offerings. They cannot uh, just uh, escape uh, the uh, or evade the responsibility which uh, must lie on their shoulders because uh, they are uh, fighting uh, the war and they must uh, fight the war on the marketing front or the sales front you know, by being very clear about the objectives uh, which uh, laid the foundation for the introduction of that offering and uh, they should be the people to be able to sell the way they committed or the way they very positively indicated. So these salespeople uh, have got to understand uh, not only the, the volume side of uh, the sales which they are responsible for, they also have to have a very good understanding of the costing factor which I talked about uh, a, a moment ago. It is not that uh, the salespeople also are going to have to be uh, the costing experts, it is that uh, they should know the kind of uh, the contributions um, being brought by different uh, the offerings that they are handling uh, in the marketplace. And uh, they should know that uh, the, any brand could, which is very close to their heart uh, should be the one could, which also brings their company a fairly decent level of contribution. Uh, so this is how could, you involve these people and this is how you educate these people and this is how you maximize the positioning of all the offerings by educating your peers. This is part of the audience. You remember that acronym? as part of uh, the positioning concept and uh, the E being the last letter of the word audience that relates education. So you, you've got to educate these people about uh, the factors which are so delicate and which uh, really are very sensitive uh, in relation to uh, their uh, the contribution toward the overall goals of the company because uh, you are out to make sure that uh, the vision of the company is uh, the fulfilled and therefore the brand vision which has translated into different strategies then has got to be fulfilled as well. So that's very important. Um, the argument you know, generally given by salespeople is that uh, just look at uh, the, the overall level of sales which existed uh, so many months ago. Uh, let us st start talking about the same example of 100 units and they might um, turn around and tell you a look at uh, the sales volume that uh, we have today it is 125 and uh, we have brought to you 
an increase of about 25 percent. Now the question is if uh, that increment of 25 percent coming uh, the way of the company, if that has come with the help of like you know five different brands, but what is the beauty of uh, with carrying all those brands? Uh, that if you have so many different problems in the areas of production, in the areas of logistics, and um, in other areas that are that I talked about. Now I'm not uh, the being uh, the anti uh, the brand manager or kind of um, counter marketing here. No, all I'm saying is that you've got to take a very balanced view of business management when you're working in any department uh, of the company, or you are responsible for any function um, falling within the overall ambit of uh, the game of business. You've got to make sure that there are. Um, compatibilities and you've got to make sure that there is uh, sanity uh, in all the decisions and in all the actions which uh, are being uh, are followed and undertaken in the marketplace. So in other words, uh, you, if you are in a position to sell that volume of 125 but by having a lesser number of brands um, in relation to a, a larger number of brands, you should go for uh, the lesser number of brands. Now, the challenge here is, how do you do that? Well, that is um, what uh, you may call as another fix or as another factor uh, which uh, helps you to offset the negative side of an extension is withdrawing those uh, offerings uh, which are not very highly profitable, meaning product withdrawal. This uh, might sound very painful. We're going to have it that uh, the brand which uh, took birth um, within the company uh, should be withdrawn. That amounts to the killing something that we created uh, with our own hands. But then you've got to be realistic. Now, the important thing and the most sensitive thing here is that uh, you are assuming a situation which is a situation of brand proliferation. You are uh, talking about a situation uh, with which uh, may lead to the cannibalization. And you are talking about a situation uh, which is not very attractive um, in terms of the number of brands that you carry and the relationship of that with the level of volume that you have. Now, that, there's got to be some kind of uh, sanity. There's got to be some kind of equation, you know. So, you should withdraw those which will not turn your customers away. That is where the key lies. You, now, you might argue, how is it that a brand which has some following, uh, but maybe it has a very small following, some customers are going to be uh, turned away and uh, they will uh, switch over to competition. Well, the answer lies in trying to retain those customers to your other offerings. And you can retain those customers uh, to your other offerings uh, by talking uh, or by communicating a lot of sense about those which you want to retain. Because what is happening is, if you are withdrawing on the one hand, you are fortifying or strengthening uh, others on the other hand. So those you know, which uh, are fortified by uh, you should be the ones to uh, win over uh, your customers uh, in small number, of course, uh, who uh, switched over to your offering, uh, which you have now somehow decided to uh, withdraw from the market. So that is uh, all about uh, the withdrawal. Uh, having uh, talked about that, you know, I would say that uh, that completes our understanding about the uh, concept of line extension. Having done with that, let us now get to start talking about the concept of brand extension. Do not confuse that with the overall loose terminology which we use in the marketplace by calling everything brand extension. Brand extension, like I told you, is not that we, we, we deal with different categories, that we deal with different uh, product areas that we deal with um, different opportunities with which are being offered uh, to uh, the company uh, to get into 
uh, different uh, markets only because uh, their brands happen to be valuable and the brands happen to be highly profitable and very powerful. So you get into brand extension. Uh, what is brand extension and uh, why it has uh, come into uh, there is so much practice nowadays? Uh, the factors that we're going to talk about are very close to uh, the ones that we talked about in relation to line extension, but there are certain subtle differences and we've got to have a clear understanding of those subtle differences so that we should not be the ones to start making decisions, uh, very sensitive and very strategic decisions about getting into a new area altogether which may be very hostile and which may not be very business friendly uh, in relation to our company. Uh, not in relation to overall business, but in, re in relation to our company. So, uh, what are those factors that we've got to have a very clear understanding of that? And uh, I shall, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, gonna look forward to the talking about those factors uh, with you in the next lecture because uh, it looks like uh, we are running uh, out of time. So, Allah Hafiz, until that, and uh, see you in the next lecture.